Hello and welcome to this joint production of the Indian Writers Forum and News Click. Today we are joined by Mr. Jürgen Bos. He's the President CEO of the Frankfurt Book Fair. And uh, he's here in Delhi for the 32nd International Publishers Congress. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I was, since uh, I work at the Indian Writers Forum where we talk and discuss issues around freedom of speech and expression, I was looking at the history, uh, the recent history, really, of the Frankfurt Book Fair, and it seems that you really had to walk a very tight rope when it came to uh, first the Chinese delegation, then Rushdie's invitation, and then I think the Turkish uh, uh, delegation. So how, how do you w walk this very tight rope? Actually, it's uh, the, the DNA of the Frankfurt Book Fair. It's, um, it always has three dimensions. There's the uh, economic dimension, it's about selling rights. Yeah. There's a cultural dimension, the reading, the literature festival, the cultural festival, but there's always a political side because books and writers, the people behind the books, are per se political when they describe the world as it is. And actually the history of the Frankfurt Book Fair goes back like a thousand years. And, um, and, then, and, and, and the first moment it became political when there was censorship. Yeah, and this happened already in the 15th century when actually the Catholic Church tried to censor what was printed by Gutenberg. So Frankfurt, the book fair, which was founded in, in a smaller town about 100 kilometers away from Frankfurt, had to move to Frankfurt because this was a free city which belonged to the emperor and where a lot of trade was possible and no censorship. So it's the DNA of the book fair being political. I, I, I like the fact that you call it the DNA and there are other interviews that I was looking where you say that uh, that the Frankfurt Book Fair is one marketplace and I'm quoting where it has been about the people and basically getting groups of people from across the world. It is the largest book fair in the world. So, but there is a contentious issue of selecting and 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 arranging these these. So how do you how do you make that selection? How do you go through that decision that the largest representation is possible? No, actually it's not like we would curate who's coming. Yeah? People come because it's this big, it's this marketplace, it's this platform to talk to each other. And we have people from 150 nations coming. And there might be book fairs which have a large attendance, but it's about selling books. Frankfurt is about um, intellectual property and it's also this cultural dimension. So it's uh, that the publishers would bring their authors to Frankfurt. So we don't know what to expect. It can be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, it could be Salman Rushdie, it could, could be anybody. But on the other hand, we do have a responsibility for our book fair. So we choose some writers, we choose politicians, and invite them to come to Frankfurt because there's a certain direction in this liberal, humanitarian, in the history of Aufklärung, enlightenment, which is very important. That's our tradition. So if you have a country who says our official delegation, like China, brings these writers, then we would also invite writers which might be controversial. So we always try to balance. Yeah? So this is our role actually, to balance and actually bring people together. But uh, balancing is a difficult act. How do you negotiate with, say, government and official delegations and at the same time with writers? How, how, how can you give like a few instances where, where it's a little more specific of this, this approach that you're talking about? No, again, like two years ago, we had invited Salman Rushdie to speak at our opening press conference, which was a very important uh, uh, for me, because at that time we had the feeling that there's a lot more censorship in the world again. There's a lot more populistic politics in the world again. Yeah, it's in Europe, you see it in Poland, you see it in Hungary, you see it in many countries. You see it in North America, you see it everywhere. It's populistic. And populistic means that people don't listen anymore. And then what we think, it's about acceptance. We don't, do not have to tolerate other people. We have to accept the other viewpoint. So it seemed for me logical to have Salman Rushdie in Frankfurt because he had a different view and he spoke up. And then he came in, uh, got into these, this, in the middle of these this, uh, political, uh, religious discussions. Yeah? So he seemed to be the most prominent person I could get, which is a symbol for freedom of speech. In fact, in that particular festival, he said uh, that uh, the guardians of freedom of speech are to be found in publishing. But uh, I'd just uh, like to, and there's another comment that he made at the, at, at the, at the opening, in fact. He, uh, he supported the writer's protest that happened here in India, uh, uh, where several writers felt that there was an impingement on their freedom to write uh, with the rise of the populist uh, 
governments el elsewhere, we, we've seen such a thing here in India. Are you aware of that, that the fact that he also at the festival uh, supported the movement here? Yes, sure. And, and it, but it's not a typical Indian problem. You can see this everywhere. And this week I'm also going to speak tomorrow actually about uh, self-censorship. So it doesn't look like censorship, but some sometimes people are afraid to speak up, yeah. Or people, um, uh, especially as we said, in, in populistic countries where you suddenly get into economic trouble as well, yeah. And you start thinking, do I have to publish this? It's going to bring me into trouble. It's not doing harm to me, but even it might hurt my economic interest. But that's already censorship, isn't it? Yeah, if you think this way. And what's happening uh, uh, in India, it's also, I think there is a, a, a stadium where people sometimes are afraid that when they speak up, they should be quiet, yeah. Since we were talking about self-censorship, there's, there's has, there has been this fear that the rise of, say, global conglomerates in publishing, for instance, Amazon and others, uh, it'll sort of stifle uh, other publishing areas. Do you, do you share that concern? Actually, right now, I didn't understand it. You think the global corporations? Global corporations like Amazon. Yeah. Sort of, there's this fear that it might buy into uh, certain like small publishing industries, etc. Here, for instance, independent publishers who work in India. And uh, I can give you the Indian con context, for instance, there's a host of publishers. And in fact, we do a mm -hmm. number of interviews with independent publishers. Yeah. But I'm sure they find, a, and, and some of them have told me that they find a place in your book fair, for instance, that oh, yeah. we have these other places where. So yeah. do, do you think it's a, it's a valid concern that the rise of... No, I don't think so, because usually um, you see the rise of large corporations and then they break up again. It seems to be like a rule when you remember IBM for many years or, or what happened to these huge corporations. On the one hand, I do believe this will happen to these as well in one point of time. On the other hand, I think that... Um, uh, there will be political decisions actually to uh, to break up these huge conglomerates, and the third thing is actually I think independent publishing will be there forever, yeah, because they are the ones who identify the new voices, the young authors. Without the, the, the independent ones, the smaller ones, there will be new, no huge conglomerates, yeah, because uh, these conglomerates lose all their power. Then they have to buy an, uh, again an independent, a young independent, actually to get new energy. Yeah, it's, it's a strange world in publishing, yeah. It's not the huge ones which are making, which are building up the authors. It's the independents. They're building them up and then the author of the two books move to a conglomerate. And the same ha is happening in the internet, yeah. There's a huge legacy, I mean, I'm sure you carry it. It's, it's the, the book fair is, has a huge history. So, and uh, th there have been changes in, in the way we perceive and think about literature and the books. So, how, how do you carry that that whole tradition of thinking of, of, of the enlightenment of, of, of books really which which matter to us to this current time here which is which is a rather crazy movie yeah. that we're living in so it is but actually if you if you boil it down to not to the medium not to the book but to the people to the author and the readers or to the publisher translators there are a lot of people in this value chain yeah who work on storytelling if you think of it only as storytelling and it doesn't matter whether you, there's a printed book, whether there's an electronic book, whether there's an audio book, whether there's video streaming. It's always storytelling. Yeah? So you, if you focus on the people, and that's what we're doing in Frankfurt, we try to focus on everybody in, in this economic value chain, but also uh, if you think we have about 10,000 journalists in five days coming. Yeah? But, but, and everybody tells his own story about what he's seeing, about the people he's seeing, about the stories in the books. And that's what is so important and that's why we have to change ourselves because these people are changing all the time. And in my 30 years in the industries, I've seen so many things coming up. When I, when I started, I still had to learn typesetting. Yeah, and now there's, uh, it's all digital. Yeah? Yeah, we had the first uh, Xerox machine and everybody thought this is going to change our world. Everybody's going to steal our books because you can co photocopy everything. Yeah, then the first fax machine, which seemed to be a threat. The first audio books where we thought, oh no, this is going to take everything away. So it's, it's happening every seven years you see something new coming. And, but you see it, uh, somebody said it, you have to see it as an opportunity, not as a threat. Keeping that in mind, I'd, uh, I'd also like, since you touched upon this a little bit, and I'd like you to talk a little bit more at length on the question of self-censorship. And I think related to that is also the question of how... Uh, certain uh, 
mediums make news which were not ways in which you could make news earlier for instance the phenomenon of fake news yeah uh, phenomenon of i don't know what they call it the post truth world mm -hmm. these uh, uh, concepts which are in some ways new so how do you how do you how do you see that actually everybody finds his own truth yeah and this is the problem yeah because if people want to believe what they hear yeah we call it now uh, as you said fake news yeah but for some people it might be the truth because that's what they want to hear so the only thing we actually can do is educate the people we can we we, we have to go into schools we have to tell people to have a critical mind which brings us back to aufklärung to enlightenment yeah yeah this is so important now it's even more important yeah, than ever people sometimes tend to make things try to simplify things but think nothing's simple nothing so, and if you understand that, then you have to question everything. My final question to you will be about translation. What are the ways in which the Frankfurt Book Fair concentrates on this particular matter? Because I've, I've actually spoken to a lot of uh, publishers, and I understand what h how they feel about, you know, you're always translating some other, other culture that you want to know of, but it's not your own culture. Sometimes, I mean, not all the time, but most of the times, this is sort of the strategy in which and then you want to bring that that culture and tell your people, hey, this is this is something exciting that I, that I think I should share with you. Um, but do you think that this particular ethos is is, is shared uh, around the publishing world? And if it's not, how do you with, at the at the book fair see this? Yeah, yeah. On the one hand, you see, there's not one publishing. There's a lot of different. There's educational publishing, children books, whatever. You see. And I think um, uh, every book opens a new world to somebody, so translation is substantial. But on the other hand, we have a problem because everybody's going for the one bestseller. And usually you buy English from the English world and translate into your language. It's a one-way direction. Yeah? Books being translated into American English it's in, in, in the North American market is less than 3%. It's nothing. In Germany it's more than 30%, which are translations. Um, in India, with its 17 languages, it, it's another challenge. Mm -hmm. You even have to do all the translating here. So I, I, I do believe translation is substantial. Luckily, we have a lot of passionate people, which brings us back to the independents. Mm -hmm. yeah? We we'll try to find their niche, and their niche might be translating from a certain language, where they know the authors, where they would travel to. So there are a lot of specialized agents in our world. And actually, there's a lot of translation funding around. Yeah, so what we even, we ourselves um, um, uh, uh, have a sister company, which is a not-for-profit, it's an association, which is focusing on translations from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Because these three uh, regions, actually, there are not enough translations That's in the market. So we try to find the money and to subsidize these translations. Uh, have you been to book fairs here? Uh, I've been to the Daily Book Fair years ago. Not, not this year, but it's some time ago. And I've been to... Um, uh, to the Calcutta Book Fair, which is a long time ago, because then they everything burned down that the next year. So you know how long ago <laughs> this is. I was quite young, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a long time ago. Uh, what what you do? Because I, I have a feeling that I, I, I haven't been to your book fair, but it's a like here it's it's called it's, there's another term used. It's called uh, Oi Mala, which is like a like a more like a carnivalesque uh, mm -hmm. meeting place where it's not so much in terms of business and understanding. Yeah. It's more about, so how, how do you, I just, I'm just curious to know what you felt when you were no, 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 again, it's always about the people and I like to be here because I had a lot of friends with Indian publishers, so for me it's a place where I can meet people. But what's very different from Frankfurt is in Frankfurt you cannot buy books, yeah, and here it's a huge market, yeah, yeah, people tend to buy discounted books, yeah, and that, that that's a big difference, so you're right, it's a marketplace, it's like a carnival on the one hand, and, um, but I, I think Frankfurt is more like a, a mixture from the Chepu Literature Festival. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, this, uh, our backbone is the, 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 the right street, mm -hmm. where it's very quiet and all, little tables, you, no carnival at all. So this is very different. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.